I, I don't trust me, no, there's probably somebody in the street who's knowledgeable on that. Like 30 years after the crucifixion. Well, let's just remember that with regard to the actual manuscripts, there are actually hundreds of these manuscripts, in fact thousands, and they all contain little portions, and all of them are differently dated. And as regards their actual text, they actually vary from text to text. Okay. So there's no such thing as just one gospel. There's quite a wide range of opinions about when the original gospels were written. Yes. Um, I don't think I've heard anyone saying as soon as nine years after the crucifixion. Well, I, I personally don't. Um, I wouldn't be able to give an argument on that. The only thing I could say is that uh, it may very well be that the late compilation was from earlier things that Mark and Luke had written around the time. Um, but and I think it's also quite important to note that um, you know. The letter is one piece of evidence. Um, you may invest faith in it, you may not. Um, but the reality is, is that if you're going to take a viewpoint on what happened to Jesus, you have to. You, I mean, you can you can believe whatever you want to believe. You all have that right. But um, the logical way of, of appraising the situation would be: what evidence is there available to me? Well, you know, the letter is just one piece of evidence. If you look at all of the other pieces of evidence, they seem to corroborate this this idea that he, you know, survived the crucifixion and moved towards the east. Yeah. Um, we know that St. Paul was a real person, and that he went, uh, hence a real person, he went on the road to Damascus, and he saw this vision, he claimed he saw the vision of Jesus Christ. Why Paul are you persecuting me? Sorry, Paul? Yes, yes. Yeah. Paul, why are you persecuting me? Uh, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting yeah. me? And he, then he went into Damascus with some Christians, yeah. and was told the story, and he became converted to Christianity. Yeah. Uh, now, none of the Christians in those days ever mentioned that Jesus Christ going to India, leaving uh, Palestine, and leaving Israel, going to elsewhere. Yeah. They all concentrated on converting people within Israel, and then when they had the, uh, later converting the pagans, in inverted commas, yeah. to Christianity. So I don't understand why you know, all of this information that you say was not available to these early Christians and did not mention this. They, they, they originally were terrified when Jesus died on the cross. Yeah. Uh, they, and then later on, their demeanor changed to be very passionate people who did believe, yeah. right there wrong, that Jesus Christ was the, the Messiah of the Jews. Yeah. It seems surprising to me that all this information was unavailable yeah. and they did not believe this or any of this. Well, the, the thing is... Dick Paul, where, yeah. where he's converted, he was a, a Jewish anti-Christian, yeah. becomes uh, a, a, a passionate Christian. Yeah. Well, as I said, with... Um, well, what you're so essentially saying, why is it that they didn't know about this, that he went to India? Is, this that, your is that your question? Why well, they it's basically, no, I mean, all the Christians did not mention this whatsoever. <coughs> and Paul was converted on this seeing, yeah. The, yeah. seeing an right. image of well, Jesus Christ. I, just, I, think, I think the answer to, from our perspective, my perspective is that if you, look at the, if you look at Christian history, you'll actually find that there were two types of Christianity. They were running side by side for quite a few, almost a few centuries. There was the, the Church of St. James, and later they became known as the Ebionites, and they were a Unitarian church. And if you look at the history, you'll actually find that there was the Church of St. James and the Church of St. Paul that ran side by side, and, and Paul and James actually despised one another. They really hated one another, because the Church of St. James did not actually believe that they were anything different but Jews. They believed that they were Jews who had accepted the Messiah. And then there was the Church of St. Paul, and, and it should be noted that the Church of St. James didn't preach to non-Jews. It only preached to Jews. And the Church of St. Paul preached to everybody. Preached to Romans a lot. Um, and this is something that Czech St. James, uh, St. James and Paul had a great uh, dispute over. So did Peter. Peter had a dispute with them yes. too. Yes. And um, so for a long time, the Church of St. Paul and the Church of St. James ran parallel. And when at the... Um, which Roman was it? Was it? It was the Council of Nicaea, um, the Emperor Constantine, I believe, yeah, yeah. who became, um, who adopted St. Paul's Christianity over St. James's. And essentially, because of his conversion to St. Pauline Christianity, um, the whole of the Roman Empire got converted to Paul's Christianity, and St. James's church essentially withered out. It's, it's also very interesting to note that St. James's church um, rejected some of, many of the doc doctrines that St. Paul's church wholeheartedly accepted. And, um, and, and so that's why, um, that is one explanation for why this information wasn't really part of the Pauline um, dogma and really didn't become part of, of what we now know as modern Christianity.
the, um, the because thing, it died out with, with the ebionites. The thing, to, the thing to bear in mind also is that this information isn't actually new. For the people who live around Kashmir, this information is old news. They have always thought that it is the place of Isa Masih. For example, there's a, there, was a, um, there was a particular man I know of. He went to this area about 80 years ago and he spoke to the woman who is the, she was in charge at the time. It was a particular family that looks after the tomb. And she was in charge of the um, tomb. And she said, this is the tomb of Isa, uh, which is Jesus in Urdu, which is what they spoke. And the man said to him, said to her, why do you say that it is Isa? Because Muslims, and she was a Muslim, believe that he is in heaven. The, that's the majority Muslim belief, and as I've shown you, which is contrary to, the, to their actual teachings in a way, in the Quran. Um, is why, why do you believe that he, this is the tomb of Jesus? And she said, let, let the Orthodox believe what they want. We, we've been told by our forefathers that this is the tomb of Jesus. And so this information that you're getting now is actually just because of communication essentially increasing in the world. And that now we can know what they know, whereas in the past it wasn't like that. Um, yes, please. Um, first of all, how do you explain water also coming out of this chest? Um, well, there are several theories about that. I think, well, there are. There are there's one main theory, that is when you're hanging like this, you develop pleurisy. Um, and that if it had punctured pleura, it would definitely have been water and blood separated. Um, and even in actual fact, in actual fact, you don't actually get water and blood separation even in death. You never see water and blood coming out separately. So the actual noticing that blood and water came out separately is an indication of pleurisy, but it's also an indication that you want death, which is, if we ask you the other question, should we go to one of them? Well, I don't think question then would be, did he not develop the pneumothorax after that? But he may well have done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we also know that some pneumothoraces can spontaneously dissolve. Yeah. In young men get pneumothorax. <laughs> the other question is, this other, I actually know very little about that. They do discuss it, but they so they show that there's actually very little. They should in this too, in this um, the uh, the the yeah that one. That if you type in Jesus in India, you can see the whole of it. They they first actually talk about alternate theories and they disprove that and they show how it just couldn't have happened. And the south of France, they show there's very little evidence for it. Actually, there are just a few well, here and there middle age manuscripts. Well, bear in mind that you know as. Um, as was mentioned in the documentary, um, Palestine was the eastern edge of the Roman Empire. Now, realistically, if um, if he did want to get away from the Romans, which is perfectly you know reasonable, he's not going to go back into the Roman Empire and go through the Roman Empire and into France. He's going to get away from the Roman Empire. Plus, you've got the you've got the additional impetus of the other ten tribes of Israel. Um, and if he did believe himself to be the Messiah, then in fact it's perfectly reasonable that he would want to go and seek them out and, and preach to them. So if how old was he when he died, and did he well, have any descendants? Well, we don't know about descendants. We don't know about descendants. With respect to um, his death, it's actually quite extraordinary. Yusuf Saf, the character in India, and this is not a type of mythology. This is documented that he actually died at 120 years, so he lived to a very old age. I mean, and it's suspected. I mean, medically now, the doctors say that 120 years is about the, the limit of human life. Um, and it's interesting because, according to Muslim philosophy, at least, when uh, when people try to well, any philosophy in actual I mean, it kind of makes sense, but you know, let me let me say it according to Muslim philosophy. According to Muslim philosophy, when people try to kill a prophet, then to show the truth of that prophet, God causes that prophet to live to the very limit of his life. Um, 